hold. So um, if I don't get that finished, you guys can finish that off over the weekend for the review on Monday. Okay. Um, if you're interested, <laughs> uh, Dr. Barbo, send me the data from yesterday. Um, he has a research project going that he needs young women volunteers for. Oh, yes. So if you contact him, he will give you um, an IRB, you have to sign permission and yeah. understand what all he's going to be doing. Okay. So you could absolutely volunteer for that. I'm going to do it. So, not that I'm young, but I still count, apparently. Um, although, he did say, didn't he say yesterday that if you were over 45, you had to have a physician. trained yes. physician in the room? So I said, well, then that's not fair. That means I can't be in the study. He went, oh, no, we can get around that. You just have to sign a waiver if you drop dead it. <laughs> what? Uh, is it, is it Michael Marlowe a trained physician, too? No. 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 So, uh, he sent me the data. From the young lady yesterday, and I printed it out, but it's a little tiny. So, if you would like it, I, what I will try and do on Monday is open it up and somehow make it bigger, and I'll load it into Blackboard and let you guys know that it's there. All right? Because it's really very interesting looking at her. Can we? I stopped covering RER with this class because it's um, it's such a technical measure and you've got no way of really doing that unless you have access to that kind of equipment. So, but it's got some really cool information about her VO2 and her heart rate and her ventilatory rate, how, how many breaths she was taking and where the jump occurred that last couple of minutes everything changed very very rapidly right so if you go back and think about our lactate threshold idea that's where she went around the corner on the lactate threshold and once you go around that corner things go downhill very fast okay. so I will get that and then say if you contact him any of the girls that are interested, he will be happy to have more volunteers for his study. Okay, so what happens if we overheat? Right? How bad can it get? What do we need to be looking out for? What are the symptoms we want to watch? Right? So um, cramping often occurs at normal temperatures. But, so because they can be due to dehydration rather than just the heat, all right? But heat cramps, muscle cramps that occur when one is exposed to heat. So if I'm dehydrated and I'm working out in a hot environment, or if I have a sodium deficit or any other electrolyte imbalances, it's also uh, can be linked with just neuromuscular fatigue. So if I'm just not, um, if I'm, if the signal at the neuromuscular junction is slow or I'm run out of calcium, then, then we can see cramping. So typically triggered by intense exercise. Uh, sometimes it will occur during the exercise. Sometimes it occurs right at the end of some exercise. So it could, if I've been training and now I'm sitting down, for some people suddenly see cramping at that point. Um, and it is really, really painful if you watch the tennis during the summer, particularly when, like, the US Open, because it's very hot, very humid in New York at that time of the year, then you quite often see tennis players cramping up, I'm sure, soccer players, 
um, as well. Right? Very, very painful. Uh, it's the most common form of heat illness um, when you look at the first three weeks of tour days. So if I'm a football player coming back to college and I um, am at college somewhere hot and humid, then in the first three weeks of three a days, heat cramping is the most common thing you see. Probably, my guess would be because they're not quite as fit when they come back and you chuck them into two a days, and that's a big jumping <coughs> workload. So, um, some people find taking salt tablets or increasing the salt they use on their food helps with cramping. For some people, it does not help. So, but you want to make sure that you're as fully hydrated as possible. See if you can avoid getting cramps. Next level of heat illness is syncope. Syncope is characterized by fainting or feeling faint, feeling dizzy, lightheaded. Um, it will often occur when you are stationary after having been physically active in a hot environment. So whether you're sitting or standing, that point where you're just still after you've been working. So part of that is because you've got excessive peripheral dilation. So if I'm, we said on Wednesday, right, that if I'm working out really hard, we get flush. Okay? Some people will also get flushed across their back, on their arms, on their legs, because we divert blood flow to the skin to release heat. Well, that's great as a heat release mechanism, but if all the blood is flowing to the skin, it means I've got less blood returning to the heart <clears throat> because it's being diverted, it's taking a longer route to get back to the heart. And so we see, um, we see an impact on cardiac output. I can't push out as much blood per minute because the blood's moving to the skin so much. We see pooling of bloods in the, blood in the legs, so that also reduces venous return. Right, so when I'm stationary after I've been moving, all the capillaries and the arteries and the veins are all extended, they're all dilated, and so blood tends to pool a little more when I'm stationary. Right. You can see, obviously, dehydration. If I'm dehydrated, that's going to make me at more risk of this problem. And it can actually lead to damage in the brain cells. So you want to watch out for that one. It's more common in individuals who are not acclimatized. So if you've been careful with your training program and not dropped straight into a really high intensity program the first day it's 105 degrees, you know, or you've been working up with the temperature so that you're not traveled in, you live here and one day it's 80, the next day it's 50, the next day it's 70, then it's 80, then we go back to snow, right? So we get some acclimatization as the heat gradually rises. If you're traveling in from somewhere that's cool and you're not acclimatized, then you're more likely to have this problem. Next level is heat exhaustion. And heat exhaustion um, due to exercise has many factors that play a role in developing these signs and symptoms. So some of the factors are if I'm sweating very heavily and I'm losing a lot of body fluids. And I'm dehydrated. So I'm going to be dehydrated if I'm sweating that much and I'm not maintaining my water intake. If 
I'm sweating that much, we're seeing a lot of sodium loss, right? And energy depletion. So if I'm working out really hard, then my glycogen stores are getting depleted, right? Typically, heat exhaustion is uh, more often seen in a hot and humid environment than a hot and dry environment. Um, but with heat exhaustion, we see that core body temperature go up to quite dangerous levels. So from 98.6, so at the range then for heat exhaustion, anywhere from 97 to 104. So it, your core temperature is going to go up a lot, right, from your average. And some of the things that you might feel, or your athlete might be telling you, or your PE student, that they feel quite weak. If you watch the color of people, if they're getting very pale, but they're working out very hard, right, those two things do not go together. Ever, ever, ever. If you are working out hard, you should be getting ready. Right? So if they're getting pale, if their lips are pale, if their skin is looking pale, then that should always be a red flag, even if it's not in the heat. Right? You can't be pale and exercising. That those just don't go. Okay? Um, if they're getting headaches, if they're feeling sick. Um, they may not want to eat, right? Those are signs of heat exhaustion. S because there's so many symptoms and there's so many things playing a role, it can be difficult to distinguish heat exhaustion from exertion or heat stroke, which is the next level up, right? And exertion or heat stroke puts people at risk of death. So, the recommendation is, if you see any of these kinds of symptoms, assume it's the worst case scenario. If it turns out to be heat exhaustion, they'll recover a lot more quickly, but you don't want to assume it's heat exhaustion and then it turn out to be heat stroke, because now you're in trouble. Right? So let's have a look at heat stroke. Heat stroke is a really, dire medical emergency, right? Um, if you don't treat it quickly enough, people can die. We hear stories a lot about athletes dying at the beginning of season in a hot, humid environment, right? Um, and what happens in heat stroke is that the body can't any longer dissipate heat from the exercise that it's doing. So the thermoregulatory center, particularly the hypothalamus, gets completely overwhelmed and that leads to the problem. The core temperature is elevated above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, that starts to cause cellular damage to organs and to tissues and to the hypothalamus. And so the heat loss mechanism then just shuts down completely. Well, you know, I'm already hot, and then I turn off all the things that are helping me lose heat. And so once that happens, then core temperature skyrockets very quickly. Right. Um, let's see, where else am I going? Death can occur uh, from 109 degrees upwards. So um, once, you're, once you're at heat stroke, if you can't cool the body down and help out the heat dissipation, then someone's going to die relatively quickly. So are you supposed to, if someone was at heat stroke, are you supposed to submerge them in cooler water? Yeah. What if they're just at heat stroke? Well, if it's heat exhaustion, it's not going to hurt to put them in the water. It's not going to shock the water. So, like, is that for things you're not supposed to submerge them? It, it is. And I can see, I mean, I, I, I've had the same questions with this piece of information because if someone has a heart issue, 
and they're really hot, do I put them in cold water? But I think the thing is, it doesn't have, maybe I don't put them in freezing water, I just have it cool. Or I wrap them in wet towels rather than put them in a bath of water. I mean, the, the thing is, you can't, you, you don't have very much time yeah. if they reach this stage. So, they're going to die anyway, if you don't put them down. <laughs> Seriously! <laughs> so, it would be okay, Seriously. It would be okay right? if it was like an ice bath, like if they're going in the heat drop, and this water is extremely cold, you put them on top and they should be okay. It's not going to make it worse. No. <clears throat> Is it going to shock the body? Probably. Is shocking the body going to be worse only if they have a heart problem? Yeah. I would think. Okay. I don't know that I would make the water icy. I would make the water cool, mm -hmm. would be my first step. And then once they had started to cool down a bit, I might add ice to it after I've already got them mm -hmm. cooling down. I'm not an athletic trainer though, I mean, I would, that's a really good question to ask mm -hmm. Laura and Adam. Just, <laughs> just kidding. Put you in the wall, yeah. I mean, you do, you, you so got... That's why I asked, because I think Laura said if they go to, if you touch them to not smudge it because we, they do put ice in it, but in their tubs. Right. So it might shock them. Like, you know, that's why I asked. And I was like, oh, I've been told one thing, I've been told another time. I was like, oh. the, the, the stuff I've read, read, the stuff I've read always says, assume this is stroke. <coughs> because the symptoms are initially similar. Mm -hmm. And so. If I'm heading up to 104 degrees and I don't get this person cooled down, it's going to turn into stroke anyway. Mm. So, um, I would imagine, where is that piece of paper? I'm pretty sure I have this article loaded for you. There's, um, the ACSM had a, um, guideline document that they published uh, in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. And I'm pretty sure in there it says cool them off as quickly as you can. So, I mean, if you know it's heat exhaustion, not heat stroke, yeah wet towels, get them in the shade, put wet towels over their head, wrap their body, get their clothes off and wrap their body in wet towels. Um, might be enough, or at least you could start that way and then put them into water. I don't know. I just don't want to kill that. No, I, I understand the book. But wouldn't you have prior knowledge if they had a heart problem? Yeah. Well, not always. Yeah. Not you always. Mean, That's why you get sudden cardiac death. But you know, young men go out for a run and never come home. And they're dead on the trail in the wood. Because if it's severe enough, you can have right? If it was severe enough, but it doesn't have to be. Well, it can be severe enough to kill you and you not know it's there. Because if you're a young, healthy athlete, why would you have had a test? for your heart, right? So there are some heart issues that you wouldn't know you had until it was too late. Um, signs and symptoms for the heat stroke, tachycardia, so the heart rate slows down a lot, right? Uh, hypotension, lots of sweating, hyperventilation, so they're gonna be breathing very fast. They might start seizing, all right? So if someone starts having some kind of a seizure, the longer you delay cooling the body, the greater the risk of death. So that's, that's the, 
balancing it. Right? It's, it's tricky. So, are there other factors other than exercising in the heat? When we look at males and females, there doesn't seem to be any difference in the risk once you account for size. So obviously a guy is going to overheat probably more than a girl because they're bigger, they've got more muscle mass. But if you account for size, then the, the risk is not any different. Yes. I know so. talking about uh, ice bath stuff, but even being in a pool, uh, there's been instances of uh, someone having a heat stroke in while pool. exercising in a pool. Is that? In the pool? Yeah, in the the water in the pool must have been really warm. Or he was like he was doing like a workout, like a sure workout. Well, if you so, if you go to a competitive training pool for a team, yeah. the water is freezing. It is cold in a true training pool, right? Because for that very reason, yeah. because they are working very very hard and they need that water to be cool in order to, for them to lose body heat while they're swimming. So if for someone to develop heat stroke while they were swimming, the water must have been really warm. Oh, okay. So that it was warm enough that they that it wasn't absorbing the heat from their body. So like a human setting in that area of water? Because like <laughs> like you, I mean like don't you sweat while you're in the pool? Yes. Yeah. So. so sex doesn't make any difference when we look at risk. Fitness level, however, does make a difference. So the more cardio, the more aerobically fit I am, the better able I am to deal with hot temperatures and exercising in the heat. So cardiovascular fitness, when you bring your athletes back from summers <coughs> off, cardiovascular fitness should be the primary focus for the initial conditioning when you bring them back in, if you're going to be then exercising them in the heat. Right? If I want to reduce the risk of heat illness, and I want to enhance their responses and their acclimatization, I'm going to work on cardiovascular systems and I'm going to put them into a strength program straight away. Right? We're going to run, we're going to do some games, we're going to work on our, we're going to ride bikes or go swim. Right? We're going to do things that improve cardiovascular fitness before we go out there and start doing drills in 105 degrees. Age, unfortunately, makes a difference when we're looking at risk, right? The older you are, the less able your body is to deal with the stress of the heat. And so part of that is because typically in older people, cardiovascular function declines because they don't maintain an intense enough exercise program. And the decline in cardiac output, because of the decline in fitness, then reduces how well they're able to manage the heat. Honestly, once you get to like 75, even if you're staying in really great shape, it gets hotter and hotter, hot, hotter and hotter, harder and harder to deal with it being hot. Okay? My dad is in a super, super shape. It's amazing, and he's 80, and he cannot bear being out in the sun when it's really hot in the morning. And he trains every day, so okay. some cardiovascular function is going to decline regardless of whether you train, and so you're still going to struggle with it as you get older. Pleasure. So, the more fit I am, the less susceptible I am to developing any of these problems. 
So we talked about most of this idea already. Bless you. If I'm an endurance athlete, if I'm doing uh, uh, 10,000 meters or anything like that, above 5,000 meters or a 3,000 meter steeplechase, because that's a killer, right? So as heat increases, we see a linear decline in performance, right? So that can be a concern. Running endurance events is a concern for anyone who's not acclimatized if they're going to be running in the heat. Can I ensure optimal performance? So, well, if I can get there early enough and acclimatize ahead of time, that's really the best option. Proper hydration strategies. So use your hydration protocol, work out your own hydration plan, make sure that you're checking on yourself regularly, and be as aerobically fit as you can be. Anaerobic strength events, different kettle of fish, because it depends upon what the event is, how long does the event last, and how long am I actually out in the heat, because a lot of anaerobic events very, very quick, so I'm not actually out in the heat for very long, right? If I'm running 100 meters in nine seconds, nine seconds worth of heat exposure isn't gonna make me sick, right? So, um, the duration of the event and the duration of heat exposure are the two things that are important. So, if I'm under 800 meters, probably not out in the sun for long enough for that to be too much of a problem. If I'm doing a 1500 meter, that's a little bit longer. I might have to be a bit more careful. What if I am a field athlete? Right? That's always the interesting one for me. What if I'm a thrower or a high jumper? Right? And they're always out in the middle of the track. So it's great for the sprinter, because they come out the tunnel, they run their race, and they dive back into the tunnel, into the shade and the cold again, right? But what if I'm out in the middle of the track in a high jump event, right? You don't see the high jumpers crossing backwards and forwards <laughs> from the high jump back into the toilets or anything. So you've got to be a little bit more careful with your throwers and your jumpers. Can you put up some shade for them out there? So that at least they can stand in the shade in between their turn. Because okay? I don't do all my jumps at the same time. I jump my height and then I sit down until everybody's had their go at that height and then I go and jump again. Okay? So, can I provide some shade? Can I provide a big tub of wet towels so they can sit in the shade with a wet towel over their head or around their neck? So at tennis events, they have the poor old bull girl or bull boy has to stand out in the sun and hold the umbrella for the tennis player, right, when they sit down. And they put ice towels around their neck. Right? All of those ideas are good strategies to help your field athletes who don't get to pop in and out. Right. Um, just This is just verbiage. Technically, acclimation is getting used to the heat in an artificial environment. So I spend a lot of time in a sauna or I turn the heat up in the gym or Acclimatization is I go and work out somewhere hot or live somewhere hot. And I get better at dealing with that once I've been there for a while. Anywhere up to 14 days, so two weeks to get a complete set of adaptations to the heat. So much shorter time frame than it is to acclimatize to altitude, which is nice. Right, so if I, if I am going to go and compete in the heat, I don't have to look at quite so 
much expenditure to go ahead of time to get ready. Uh, the cardiovascular system takes anywhere from one to five days. My ability to regulate my core temperature can take up to a week. It's slightly different and the kinds of adaptations I see are different depending on whether it's hot and humid or hot and dry. So some adaptations are increased sweat rate. One adaptation is um, I'm going to start sweating at a lower body temperature. But the adaptation that you see tends to depend upon what the whole environment is like. Uh, conserving sodium chloride, so reducing the amount of salt that is in my sweat and in my urine takes a little over a, a week. And we make all these adaptations, but they're not permanent. All right? So if I come back from the hot environment, or if I live somewhere where it's very hot in the summer, but it's very cold in the winter, right? so if I live in, I don't know, Washington or Iowa or something, right? then I spend the first few weeks of the summer and the heat getting used to it, and then when it's really cold in the winter, it all goes away, and the next time around, I have to do it all again. Right? So at the beginning of every summer, we all struggle a little bit for a few days while we're acclimatizing back to it being 99 degrees. All right. Remember the check, these numbers are wrong, but the information is in the chapter. Hydration before exercising is crucial. Right? If I'm going to deal with training in the heat, I have to be fully hydrated when I start. Right? Sweating is a very useful uh, heat mechanism, heat loss mechanism for humans. But remember, the more you're sweating, the more water you're losing. And so you might have to increase the amount of water you're taking on board. And when you're here in the hot and the dry, pay attention even if you think you're not sweating, because you are, it just evaporates so quickly, you might not be aware of it. Hypohydration, so even just starting to be a little bit dehydrated, makes you more susceptible to the cramping in particular, because that's the most obvious one, but heat exhaustion and heat stroke as well. Okay. We'll have to dig into the whole ice bath thing a little bit more. All right, so let's, where are we? We've got 15 minutes. Let's see what we can get done on the cold stuff. that recognize altitude or heat. And those 
receptors then signal the central nervous system to start lots of different things to try to help you keep warm. Okay? But we don't have as many cold receptors as we do heat receptors, so we're not quite as um, quite as subtle at detecting the cold as we are at detecting the heat. But the, we have receptors in the skin, in the uh, um, abdominal cavity, and in the spinal cord. So here, this is someone who's standing in a cold room. And so what you see is the central nervous system's main goal is to maintain that core temperature. It has to keep your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your liver warm. Okay? So it will sacrifice your fingers, your hands, your arms, your toes, your feet, if it has to. Because you might lose a foot. That's not going to be very goodness. But it's not going to kill you. Okay? But if this temperature here drops down, you don't have very long. So this is someone in a warm room. So you can see how the body directs the blood flow to the center to make sure that it protects your organs for as long as it can. Right? So actions that occur, the first thing that happens is we see vasoconstriction at the surface. So think about when you're really cold, your skin is a little bit paler than it is when you're really warm. Okay? Because we move all this blood flow. So even, it doesn't have to be this cold, even if it's a little bit chilly, blood flow to the skin is being constricted a little bit so that we're not losing heat now that we want to hang on to. You stop sweating. You still sweat. There's always some sweat, but you stop that kind of over, over the top sweating mechanism. That doesn't happen. Again, it's a heat loss mechanism. We're trying to conserve heat. Right? The central nervous system will turn up your metabolic rate. So your basal metabolic rate increases to try to produce more heat. So I burn more calories in a shorter amount of time in an attempt to produce internal heat and keep myself warm. Um, we start to shiver. So shivering is the brain's way of making ATP and using food and therefore creating heat. Right? So I shiver as all the muscles contracting, trying to generate some more heat. Um, if you're cold enough, the hair will stand up on your arms and your legs right? because it traps the warmer air near your body hangs onto it, a bit like a down duvet. Okay? We're not as good at that as animals and birds in particular have a, a layer of fluffy feathers near their body that they can fluff up. Okay? If you watch a bird in cold weather, we're all kind of shivering away and they're sitting on the tree going and getting fluffier and fluffier and fluffier because that way they can hang on to some heat. And ultimately, you get this. Okay? If those, if I'm still getting cold, if I'm still exposed to the cold, and those initial changes aren't making the difference, ultimately we start to decrease blood flow to the muscle tissue. So hypothermia is a major threat to life and survival. Hypothermia means that your core temperature has dropped to the point where physiological function can't be maintained any longer. Right? So remember that we're looking at an average of 98.6, which is 37 degrees centigrade. 
Right? So stage one of hypothermia is just dropping down to 36 or 35 degrees centigrade. Right? So not very much. And at that point, you start to have trouble performing complex motor tasks. So think about you're outside, you forget your gloves, and your shoelaces come untied. How easy is it to tie your shoelaces up when your hands are really, really cold? Hard. It's hard, right? Because you can't feel, you're not getting the pressure senses, right? So the sensory information is not getting through properly. Blood flow to my fingers is low. And so I can't contract the muscles efficiently, right? And your breathing becomes a little bit quicker, but it becomes more shallow. <coughs> I start to, right, very shallow breathing. Stage two, 40, up to 4 degrees below, so down to 33 degrees centigrade. At that point, neuromuscular function is affected. So I start actually having trouble walking or keeping myself upright, moving my arms. So the interesting thing about hypothermia is we all know if we move, we get warm, right? So it would be sensible that if I was this cold, I would, get, I would move to get warm. The problem is it gets to the point where you can't move well. Right? Even if you want to, although you start to get some pretty squiffy thinking at this point. Right? So even if I want to move, moving is becoming harder and harder and harder. So my motivation has to be stronger and stronger. My willpower has to be stronger and stronger to try to keep me moving enough to generate some heat. Once we're below 32 degrees, we start to see system shut down, um, the brain is, starts to die, organs close off, and you don't last very long once you're here. So unless you've got access to immediate help, um, they'll wrap if they fly in. So think about what kinds of sports might be exposed to the risk of hypothermia. We've got uh, downhill skiing, you've got high altitude snowboarding, mountaineering, snowshoe, cross country skiing. Right? Yeah, uh, the X Games. The, the X Games, it, yeah, the winter. high altitude X Games yeah. now. Right? So, any of those kinds of activities, if if they can fly in and get you out, then they wrap you in heat pads, heat blankets. They'll, you know, pour warm water. They'll, they'll do everything they can to keep the organs alive long enough to get you back to the hospital. So when you're really, really cold, and it's snowing and you hit your gloves, and you go back inside, you, you put your hands in your not even hot water. And it stings. Why is it doing that? Yeah. It would be because of the <laughs> sense, the stimulation that is being sent from the uh, temperature receptors in your skin. You ever get, I hate that thing. Yeah. You ever get itchy? Like when you get really cold, so you get itchy. Itchy, you you do get itchy because generally when it remember we said that cold air doesn't hold as much moisture as warm air. So humidity is lower, the colder it gets, the lower the humidity gets. And so your skin dries out a lot faster. So I don't know about you guys, but here I have to use a lot more moisturizer in the winter than I do in the summer, and that always feels a little bit odd to me. You would think you would need it in the summer, 
but it's the winter when we all get those cracks in our fingers and things here that hurt so much, right? Not in the sun. So, um, performance responses. So we see a reduction in force production, right? So I can't generate enough ATP to maintain force production. We see a reduction in nerve velocity, so the signal moving from the brain to the muscles and the signal moving from the sensory organs to the brain slows down. Okay. Force production then diminishes power output, so I can't jump as much, it's harder to run, I can maybe walk, but it gets difficult to run. Heart rate starts to decrease. And if you have asthma, you might see a similar uh, bronchoconstriction that you get with exercise. So the bronchial dilation doesn't work, we get bronchoconstriction, that makes it even harder to move oxygen into the bloodstream. So what kinds of things can we do to try to mitigate developing those problems? There are very few physiological adaptations. So one thing I can do is try to limit the amount of exposed skin. Can I limit how much heat can escape because I have skin exposed? So uh, if you ever look at the Patagonia catalogs or um, who else does high altitude? Eddie Bauer, any of those when they have their winter catalog, all you can see of their models is like their eyes, <laughs> right? Everything else is covered up. So I want to layer clothes. I want to make sure I warm up really, really well. You've got to be careful with putting on too many clothes. So it's worth the investment to buy good quality winter clothing, wool base layers or microtherm base layers have layers because one thing that can happen is you can put on so many clothes that then you overheat. Okay. Psychological adjustment, this is not happening in my life, never going to happen, mm -hmm. I can tell myself I'm okay with it being cold and I can just teach myself to like the cold. Not in this girly, not happening, right? Physiological adaptations, as I said, very, very few, right? Unlike what we see with the heat. So, um, you see some vasodilation if the cold exposure is also accompanied with high altitude. So vasodilation helps move blood around the body and blood holds heat. So that's one way the body tries to keep you warm. And in certain populations, they have um, found that when you live in a permanent cold environment, you actually have higher basal metabolic rates than someone that lives in a typical environment. Um, physical activity during exposure to the cold, obviously if you can, before you get cold, get yourself moving, then that's going to offset the decline in neuromuscular function. I'll be able to generate enough heat to keep my muscles moving. Everybody hates going to play the Green Bay Packers, right? Because it's cold. <laughs> it's a bit like the football players look forward to going and playing in Denver because they can kick the ball further and they don't want to go play in Green Bay Packers because it's freezing. Okay. So. All right. Good. Done. Monday review. So please try to spend a little bit of time this weekend having a look at your book and your notes. So if you've got any questions,